So you've got a length of pipe with an elevation difference, and you're given pressures upstream and downstream, and the diameters, which are typically not changing, but they might be, and you're asked to find the Q. All right, and if you looked at, I was going to say what what equation? If you were you if you were um, starting to work on this problem, you've got an equation that we can use for this problem, right? That's the equation that I think there's actually two of them that we're going to use. Either one will, or out there in a Zoom call. You can VA. Go ahead. Q equals VA. Q equals VA we will definitely use. that has a Q in it that we often use. I guess I haven't said specifically, but this is a steady flow. And if that's the case, then you know that There's another equation, but that's not gonna that's not gonna tell us what the Q is. We need another equation to actually help us with the flow specification. We talked about it last time, right at the end. Oh, HS equals MP over Q. Uh, gamma? That's not an N. But oh, yeah, yeah, there is that. There is that. And let's just write it down. Right, there we Q um, gamma H A. Oh, no, they call it shaft, right? There's this equation. Right, can we use that? Well, certain sorts of problems do use this, but we don't know anything about the power input, and we don't uh, we don't have a pump or a turbine, so so that's not going to help us. But it is an equation. We remember to call this the pump power equation. So, useful equation, but not for this problem. Uh, is it the sum of forces equals the pressure times Q uh, times... Oh, that time. one, the one that the sum of forces, okay, that's another equation that... Um, and, you know, I'll say that uh, the challenge for students in this class has always been, which equation do I use? So, I think some conversation on Figuring it out, I think it's helpful here. The other equation we had was sum of forces is that one, right? But I'd say we only use this equation, I call this the momentum equation. steady flow problems, but the only time we're going to use the momentum equation is when we're either given a force and we're looking to see how that changes the momentum, 
or the other way around, we're given velocities and we're asked to figure out the forces that are uh, applied or the external forces on the control volume. So it's a useful equation, but again, not something that we use in this problem. And that leads it to the, there's one other equation we talked about on Monday. And it's the equation, it's the, you know, that I uh, sort of generically have referred to it many a time uh, in previous problems. It's got two names, at least if you listen to the way I lecture. Anybody out there on the call? Is it Q over B equals, uh, it's another Q, little Q over uh, times L. Oh, okay, there's another one, yeah, yeah. Well, you're, you're coming up with lots of good equations. Thank you for that. They're all wrong, but, but I appreciate you, uh, you doing a little course review here. He was saying, okay, uh, in, in a two-dimensional situation, like we had last time with the, um, what was it? Oh, it was the flow under a gate, right? We said that um, there's that. Okay, well. Let me write it down and then you give it a name. How's that? What was that one? Just the energy equation. The energy equation, yes. And if in this case we wrote it like this, so if we put our datum at the, um, at the center line for location two, we can replace this with delta z and it's zero elevation on the right hand side. What do we call these things? So yeah, yeah, and I refer to this either as or the energy equation. Technically, if it's the Bernoulli equation, these things, these head losses, are zero. Because that was one of the assumptions in deriving the Bernoulli equation that there were, it was inviscid, that is, no viscosity. But okay, this is the equation we will use. And you can see that it would be when we're given pressures and elevations and we're asked to find a velocity, that I'd say you should, you should head towards the energy equation, okay? Okay, now, now, let's see. Um, we're given this and this, we're given that. Actually, if the pipe diameters are given, then we only need one of these velocities calculated. So let's just assume that only one of these velocities is an unknown. And the other one we get from Qn equals Q out. What you see is that there are still two, there's two uh, unknowns here. Let's just say that um, this is unknown. And this head loss term is also unknown. We've had some previous problems where we, we the problem had the head loss as a given, but in general, when you're asked to solve a problem, you know, I, I put an eight inch pipe uh, down to such and such location and the fall is such and such feet and it's made out of cast iron uh, if I have a pressure drop of, say, 20 PSI over that length, how much water can I get through it? That's a, it's a very practical sort of problem. We still need to know how to calculate this head loss. And that, I would say, is a 
a big piece of what we're going to do in this chapter is figure out how to calculate these head losses. It's a new equation. Now they've been working on this problem for quite a long time. And Mr. Reynolds, Mr. Osborne Reynolds, set up an experimental setup. Actually, in some hydraulics labs, they have a similar sort of setup where there's a upstream side. And you collect water on the downstream side. I'm quite excited. We're working on a, a um, BS degree in environmental engineering. And part of that curriculum will be a, a hydraulics lab. We've we purchased equipment for a hydraulics lab. Gosh, um, I wrote the proposal maybe 15 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago. We've been using it a little bit. But the idea was to have a lab, and it looks like we'll actually have a, a lab in the next couple of years. Uh, and you might do something like this where you where you actually measure flows by collecting water in a, in a container. Uh, and that the, um, you can use, use the energy equation and do some deriving, uh, that is some arithmetic that I'm going to skip here. It's in the notes which are on the, but you can, um, get that, that use this as an experimental measurement of the head loss. And then you could then say, and you expect that thought about it, you'd say, okay, if the pipe is twice as long and there's some something going on, this friction, twice the pipe is going to give twice the friction, so it might give twice the head loss. That sort of argument would tell you that the head loss varies linearly uh, with the length. And so if you wrote a non-dimensional value for the head loss, that is the head loss normalized by the length of your setup, you'd say, well, what might it depend upon? This is a uh, sort of analysis you do in dimensional analysis, the chapter that we've skipped, but, but you could say, well, what processes are at work and what um, properties define those processes? And doing that, you'd say, well, Height diameter must matter. Kinematic viscosity must matter. And the velocity, plus one other thing that we haven't seen, which would be some measure of the pipe roughness. And so if you zoomed in on the zoomed in on the wall, what you might see is some sort of bumpiness that you could define with a, a length epsilon. Okay, and they call that the uh, 
sometimes referred to as the roughness pipe, or I, in some cases they call it like an equivalent sand grain rough, uh, roughness. Imagine sands of different sizes that coat your pipe. But at any rate, there is something that's going to depend on the roughness of the pipe, and generally that is why we need to be given the, the pipe material. Okay, so a bunch of experiments were done where these things were varied, and I'm just, we haven't talked about kinematic viscosity very much, but remember that um, we said that the non-dimensional number that's important here is this thing called uh, Reynolds number, which does use the kinematic viscosity. I'm going to put in the dimensions here. And you can see that the kinematic viscosity for this thing to be non-dimensional must have those units. fluid properties part of the class, we were using this dynamic viscosity, sometimes called absolute viscosity. But it comes up with a, a nice ratio that is referred to as kinematic. Viscosity. Where the word comes from, if you're not interested in forces, you're more interested in the velocity patterns and that sort of thing, that's a study of not dynamics but kinematics. We had a, I had a chapter on that, so what you would use as a measure of the stickiness of the fluid in kinematics problems is this kinematic viscosity. Okay, so Mr. Reynolds did a bunch of experiments in all manner of combinations of these things. And what he found We talked about that the differences in uh, laminar flow and turbulent flow in terms of how the how the flow looks, like the, um, the half lines of particles and the distribution of um, velocity. But if you made a plot of this normalized head loss. experiments it was plotted as a function it found that when you plotted it as a function of V velocity along the along the x-axis that it would plot as straight lines and so that this HF over L is proportional to the first power of the velocity and then the the various slopes would have to do with the diameter of the pipe and the kinematic viscosity. That was very much different than uh, the higher Reynolds numbers. 
In that case, what we saw was if you plot it against velocity, you'd see that it was proportional to v squared. It was concave up, okay? And so the fundamental difference between what we referred to as laminar flow previously and turbulent flow in the head loss, whoops, I sometimes have you seen the beats of that. H of L, H of L, H of L, okay. It's sometimes called the um, head loss due to friction, wall friction, so you'll sometimes see it called H sub F. But for now, we're gonna generically refer to it as a head loss per unit length of pipe. So it's proportional to velocity at low Reynolds is proportional to velocity squared at high Reynolds numbers. And even more complicated was the fact that We did see that uh, normalized head loss was proportional to V squared, but there's two possibilities as to uh, a constant that you might put out front of that V squared. region, and we'll, we'll um, talk about what region that is, the, this normalized head loss is a function of the, the pipe diameter and the pipe roughness, and those things alone. But there's another region where it's dependent on those things, but also the kinematic viscosity. And so, take us into next time and uh, we'll, we'll end up with being able to calculate the head loss under every circumstance by the time we get to the end of the next lecture. But for now we just know that there's a big difference between uh, laminar flow, laminar flow, the normalized head loss is proportional to velocity and turbulent flow that normalized head loss is proportional to velocity squared. So what we'd like is some way to bring these two 
descriptions of head losses into a single equation. Okay, so this is um, a relationship that determines that that constant that we had said previously be called a constant A that was um, depends on D and kinematic viscosity. And for uh, unit purposes, we, uh, again, this is something you can do in dimensional analysis. I need something that has dimensions of one over V and uh, based upon, you'd expect that the more viscous the flow, the, the higher the head loss. So you'd expect this to be in the numerator. And you'd say, well, um, the wall area occupies less of the total uh, or you think of the area close to the wall occupies less of the total cross-sectional area when the pipe is big. So you think there's going to be less pipe friction when the pipe is large. So that would tell us we'd expect D to be in the denominator and you can use that sort of um, thinking to come up to, to derive what does um, this constant have to look like. And then you do a bunch of experiments and find that it, you get this analytical result. You can uh, rewrite that as um, this as um, sixty-four over the Reynolds number dimensionless that's this distance. Oh sorry, it's So uh, that's the, the laminar flow result. You can call this term, uh, we're going to think of this term as a and what you what we've done here is that we expressed it in a way that could also be used for the um, turbulent part because instead of having uh, a velocity to the first power, we divide by a velocity and make this a velocity squared. So. What that gives you then is 
for is some result that could be used for laminar and turbulent flow. Expressing it this way, said that uh, as the velocity goes up, the Reynolds number is going to go up, so the friction factor would go down. And the result of those two things is that for laminar flow, uh, you're going to get a head loss that increases as the first power. But then we can go on and use that also to describe what's going on in turbulent flow. So this is going to be the equation that we use to cover all situations. But we've got this, this thing. This is what's referred to as the named after other researchers back in the 1800s that were doing these experiments. And it depends on this term, this dimensionless friction factor. So we still haven't yet come up with how to quantify the friction factor in turbulent flow. You know, it's complicated. Uh, but we do have an equation that we can use to do that. factor What's been found is that the friction factor, there's two possibilities. In the general case, the friction factor in a turbulent flow is going to be a function of two dimensionless numbers. The Reynolds number and what this is referred to as the relative roughness. Which again makes sense that if you're interested in the, the, the size of the bumps on the wall of the pipe, uh, you could normalize that by the size of the pipe. So that, in effect, gives the, like, the fraction of the diameter that, where the, the, that defines the height of those um, roughness elements. And then there is another region of the flow where the only thing that matters is that, and this is referred to as the relative roughness. 
So we'll find there's a region where only the relative roughness matters, and another region where both the relative roughness and the Reynolds number matter. And we'll go through that next time. Wanted to, you've got, oops, that page with the, ah, there it is, okay, I had it right in front of me. So a couple of examples. Of, uh, calculations you can make with the stuff we know so far. say that another nice thing about the, um, the kinematic viscosity is that the values for, for water are very easy, at least the approximate values at typical temperatures that we see as civil engineers are nice round numbers. So it's We have to do a lot of calculating of Reynolds numbers in this part of the class. So if we're doing it water, at just a typical temperature, if you go look up the values, you'll find that these are pretty much the um, values for kinematic viscosity, it might vary by a factor of 10% above or below that. If we then plug in these values, second and the pipe diameter in feet and I've got a different value I've got a different value for kinematic viscosity but I'm just going to use my 10 to the minus 5 that's 4 so this is uh, 4 times 10 to the fifth okay and that is definitely turbulent much greater than 4,000. So we're done with that. And then a second problem. Higher, vis higher viscosity fluid, liquid, Viscosity, but what you'll get is um, much higher. 
minus two instead of 10 to the minus five, much higher viscosity. And okay, so that, that um, gives us a clue since we're finding head loss, normalized head loss, that it probably is a laminar flow case. It is a high viscosity, although we are, it's a pretty big pipe, pretty high velocities, but a very high viscosity. the pipe diameter and the viscosity, kinematic viscosity, you get this low value for the Reynolds number. Darcy equation, calculate head loss. The laminar, put in the length. Diameter, squared over 2g. I need to help to confirm my value for the head loss. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Something different. Sixty point five. Okay. Yeah. So we did sixty four over the Reynolds number we calculated. The length of the pipe, the diameter, d squared over two g. And this equation we're going to use over and over again to get head losses. And next time we're going to in the turbulent flow cases that we more often. Uh, in water flow, how we calculate the friction factor for those cases is what we're going to do next time. Any other, any questions out in here or on the call? Okay. Zoom through it. <laughs> All right then, we're done.